Okay, good evening and welcome everybody to our first session of the year of the webinar series on the CRC 289 treatment expectation. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Vitaly Napado from the Harvard Medical School in Boston. And his talk today focuses on hyperscan neuroimaging for the assessment of therapeutic alliance mechanisms in patient clinician interactions. And I'm very much looking forward to this interesting topic. And uh, I will now hand over to Livia Azan as our young scientist representative and the host for today, who is um, so kind to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. And many thanks to you, Vitaly, for being here with us and uh, giving this great talk today. Thank you very much, Angelica. Um, first of all, happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Hope you're all doing fine. And uh, Laura, Ricarda, Kuhnen and me as your hosts uh, for today's session would also like to welcome you all. And of course, Professor Napado, who I will have the pleasure to introduce today. So and Vitaly finished his bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering at Cornell University and uh, at MIT already then earned a PhD in mechanical engineering also at MIT. Um, he furthermore completed an education in acupuncture at the New England School of Acupuncture. And he also practiced acupuncture abroad at the Beijing Hospital of Traditional Chinese Medicine in China. Today, he's a full Harvard professor and director of the Integrative Pain Neuroimaging at Martinus Center for Biomedical Imaging, and he directs the Scott Schoen and Nancy Adams Discovery Center for Recovery from Chronic Pain at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. And to wrap it up in his broad research, he has applied human functional and structural neuroimaging both to localize and suggest mechanisms by which different brain circuitries modulate pain perception. And his neuroimaging research also aims to better understand how non-pharmacological treatments from acupuncture and transcutaneous neuromodulation to cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness meditation as well, ameliorate aversive perceptual states such as pain. So I'm really looking forward to hearing this talk, especially as uh, it's uh, going um, about patient clinician interaction. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the discussion as well. Great. Well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. It's a real pleasure to be presenting in front of all of you today. <clears throat> and yes, happy Valentine's Day. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, and if somebody could just let me know to make sure that you all can see this, that would be great. It's perfect. Yes, we see the slides. Great. Okay. So um, as, um, as was just mentioned, my background is actually in engineering. And as a part of that, I got interested in magnetic resonance imaging for my PhD thesis. And that brought me into uh, neuroscience. And so for my postdoc, I do um, uh, the study of neuroscience, the study of pain mechanisms, and um, which has really culminated in the project that you're about to hear about, because it's a it's a fairly fairly technical project in terms of um, getting the systems up and running to make everything work. But I want to talk about the importance of uh, starting with kind of a softer topic, talking about the importance of therapeutic alliance, which is actually a key element of many different kinds of clinical therapies. And while the talk, in the talk today, our application was on acupuncture, the concept of therapeutic alliance actually spans multiple different kinds of interactions. Um, uh, as we know that positive social interactions are important for developing a clinical relationship, a patient clinician relationship, and also um, the construct of therapeutic alliance. So we know that social interactions significantly shape how we feel and conceptualize pain. A, a very large RCT from 2013 with 182 low back pain patients found that patient clinician and therapeutic alliance was actually a predictor and moderator of pain and other outcomes in this study. And in fact, in this study, 
the author specifically suggested to boost the efficacy of an intervention by enhancing therapeutic alliance. That was something that was, I think, very interesting for us and got the ball rolling in a way. Then a meta-analysis in 2015 for different types of psychotherapy um, RCTs found that contextual factors were actually a lot more effective than specific factors in psychotherapy for um, generating an effect size. And so here you can see the, the width of the bars has to do with how many studies were actually done with these variables. And then the height of the bars has to do with the effect size for, um, for efficacy, in this case, mostly neuropsychiatric disorders such as depression. So for example, you can see that treatment differences, many, many studies have been done to try to understand treatment differences for different types of psychotherapy, yet the effect size is, is very mild um, uh, to non-existent, whereas constructs such as empathy and therapeutic alliance um, have much larger effect sizes. And so this is an important construct for uh, not just psychotherapy, but also uh, placebo effects as we know them, especially when applied in a clinical context. And so it's really important to try to tease out and understand what are potentially the mechanisms of concepts such as empathy and therapeutic alliance. So how do we investigate the brain circuitry, the mechanisms that are supporting therapeutic alliance? Now, interestingly, clinical social neuroscience research has paradoxically studied single individuals in isolations, which doesn't really get at the dynamic and real life social interactions that are ongoing between say a patient and a clinician as they're building their relationship. So there are um, concepts that require two person methods and that's really what we need to study neuroimaging in a two person interactions where the mechanisms come from emerging interactions and can true, only truly be understood by studying both systems together. And so one way to do this is with something called hyperscan neuroimaging. And hyperscan neuroimaging is nowhere near as common as the type of neuroimaging you, you typically see. But hyperscanning is really just a term that refers to the synchronous imaging of more than one individual at a time. A lot of this, a lot of this kind of research really has has occurred with EEG, electroencephalography. And so some of the earlier studies by Lara Stalfi in Rome in 2011 looked at the concordance and increases in frequencies such as theta band in, and also alpha in relationship to um, a concept such as pilots inside of an airplane, which are outfitted with nets. And um, these researchers were looking at concordance between the brain activity of the pilot and the co-pilot during different phases of the flight from takeoff to cruising altitude to landing and found that there is, especially during takeoff and landing, there's a stronger cooperation and stronger brain concordance between the pilot and the co-pilot in this flight simulator. Uh, this type of research has also been done with studying juggling, for example, when uh, two um, naive jugglers are learning how to juggle with one another and the basically the brain concordance that occurs between two individuals, they learn this difficult task. Also, of course, with music performance, duets and even orchestra-like performances. So functional MRI hyperscanning is a lot more rare, um, but fMRI has certain advantages. It can be used to assess brain-to-brain -brain communication between individuals on both a cortical and a subcortical level and also has improved spatial localization compared to electroencephalography and other techniques such as FNIRs. Functional near-infrared spectroscopy or FNIRs is also another technique that has been used to look at hyperscanning. So um, how do we do fMRI hyperscanning? Um, there are coils that have been built that allow for more than one individual to get inside of a scanner, but uh, this is probably not appropriate for a patient clinician interaction. And so we very quickly decided this was not gonna be the way to go here. And so in our study, we had two synchronized functional MRI scanners. Um, our hypothesis was that concordance and social mirroring circuitry, which includes ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, anterior insula, and temporal parietal junction or TPJ, you'll hear me talking about that a lot, TPJ, is linked to therapeutic alliance and analgesia. So in our study, in our original study, uh, we recruited fibromyalgia patients and our clinicians in this case was acupuncturists. 
Um, in our study overview, we can explain them coming in for a behavioral visit where they're given informed consent and familiarization with the protocol. <clears throat> Patients are then randomized to either first have an intake with their acupuncturists, followed by a hyperscan fMRI session, or randomized to a no interaction so they don't meet the, um, this is kind of our control, they don't first meet the acupuncturists and then have a hyperscan fMRI with effectively a stranger that they are told is an acupuncturist and who actually is an acupuncturist. They then are crossed over to come back for a second session where you know if they didn't have the intake, they now have the intake, they meet, they build a relationship with the acupuncturist followed by a hyperscan fMRI session or vice versa. And this, this intake period is um, really the acupuncturist is told to perform the intake in a similar manner as you do in your own practice. We wanted this natural variability to be built in. And so the natural variability would then build in some variability in therapeutic alliance. And so this allows us for dynamic range and the ability to investigate the effect of different interaction styles. Our setup uh, with hyperscan fMRI was two, three Tesla MRI scanners. So at, at the Martino Center, we have upwards of eight MRI scanners. So it was uh, possible for us to find two scanners that we could uh, conduct the study in. We have MRI compatible video and audio video cameras and audio microphones that were used for this study. Um, also, we developed a way to actually synchronize the two scanners via a master and a slave laptop where um, software was specifically designed to um, send out a TTL signal, which then uh, signals the MRI scanner to start its fMRI acquisition. But that signal is then also sent over the network to the other MRI scanner, which then allows that scanner to be synchronous with the original scanner. And so this is a way that we can synchronize the two fMRI scanners during the experiment. We also monitor the, um, the, with pings, we monitor the delay in the network to assure that there is little delay as possible. It's usually on the order of tens of milliseconds. So it's not, um, it's over a local, basically local area network um, at our center. We, um, the, the patient is lying inside of the MRI room. They have a cuff attached to their leg, which is inducing pain. Acupuncture needles are inserted immediately above the cuff over the knee cap with electrodes attached. And um, the patient is basically uh, instructed and there's a boosting session for them to believe that the acupuncture will reduce pain when electroacupuncture is enacted uh, to those needles. The patient is holding a button box by which they can rate the pain that they feel from the cuff and other ratings as well. The acupuncturist in their MRI machine is holding a button box as well. The button box has several buttons that they are told is activating an electroacupuncture device that is injecting current into the needles in the patient or a different button is pressed when um, there is a no treatment condition. And so this way we account for the motor act, the motor preparation and the motor act of pressing buttons as well as actually treating or non treating the patient. And so we've, while it's, it's not the same as a clinical, a pure clinical interaction, we have attempted to make this as ecologically valid as possible in the hyperscan MRI setting. We collect, um, a lot of different types of data, in addition to brain data from both the patient and the acupuncturist. There is um, autonomic data, such as cardiac data, respiration, and skin conductance that we are also collecting. So our primary behavioral outcome is the what's called the CARE questionnaire, Consultation on Relational Empathy. And this is a measure of therapeutic alliance. So the care is asking how good was the practitioner at things like making you feel at ease, letting you tell your story, really listening, so on and so on and so on. And we have the care that's filled out by both the um, patient and by the clinician. So the clinician is able to rate themselves and how good they thought they performed during, these, um, during the intake or during other um, uh, components of the study. 
By the way, I also want to highlight the fact that this study was um, led by Dan Michael Ellingson, who was a postdoc in the lab for several years and is now back in Norway beginning his uh, academic career. So you can see here, these are the ratings of the clinicians on the care questionnaire. These are the ratings of the patients on the care questionnaire. And there uh, were different ratings taken for the intake after, immediately after the intake, clinical intake. Also um, with the social interaction and also the no interaction condition with the fMRI. So these two ratings were taken during the MRI. This rating was taken during the face-to-face -face or right after the face-to-face -face, uh, clinical intake. And one thing you can see here is, first of all, there um, was not really a difference between the intake period that was in the scanner and the social interaction MRI session, which is a, a good thing because it suggests that the, at least the MRI was um, close to as ecologically valid as we could, as there was really no difference in the cares that was rated by the patients between the two, as opposed to what was rated by the clinicians. The clinicians, I think, did notice a, a difference between the intake procedure and the MRI, which was kind of interesting. Um, also, there was a large difference between a social interaction and a no interaction condition. And so this is kind of like a fidelity uh, metric of the fact that you know, when they have an intake, they are able to build a better relationship with the, uh, with the patient the clinicians do. And so that's why you see this large difference in uh, care scores between the social interaction and the no interaction condition. So we had multiple, um, multiple fMRI scans during the fMRI session. And so what I'm about to show you here is actually unpublished uh, data. Uh, and so here, instead of uh, treating, the clinician is just instructed to watch the patient while they experience or do not experience pain. And the way this session was run is we had uh, both a solo and a dyadic condition. In the solo condition, uh, the patient is just seeing a still image of their clinician to match for facial recognition and uh, the neural circuitry associated with that versus a dyadic condition where, where there's a live video of the clinician watching the patient, right? So here the, the patient is kind of um, being attended to and aided by the fact that they can visually see their clinician while experiencing the pain. And so the cuff pain is occurring um, with this type of fMRI design where there's a rest period followed by a cue, an anticipation cue, where the, the frame around the face is lit up either green or red. And if it's uh, lit up in green, it means they are not going to receive pain. They're just going to receive some pressure with the cuff. Whereas if it's lit up in red, they are going to receive a moderate amount of pain. And so then there's a 15 second cuff pressure condition where they actually receive the cuff pressure, either painful or not painful. And then there's a rest period followed by a rating period where they rate uh, pain and, and empathy um, question items. And so this is repeated six times during our fMRI session. And for the patient, they're rating how painful was the cuff and how well did the clinician understand your pain. Whereas the clinician is rating how painful they thought the cuff was for the patient. So this is kind of a vicarious pain. And how well did they, do you think that you understood the patient's pain? So those are the pain and the empathy questions that they're answering with the button box ratings. So one thing that we found is that during the dyadic condition, the patients really did appreciate having the clinician there, uh, perhaps because they rated the pain as being lower. So the pain intensity was rated lower under the dyadic condition versus the solo condition, even though the cuff pressure was exactly the same. Also, it seemed that prior interaction increased the clinician's ability to understand the patient's pain. So this was a, a patient rated outcome. And um, so here we have the no interaction condition in blue, the clinical interaction condition in red. So when they do build a relationship, uh, the patients are rating higher on the clinician's ability to understand the patient's pain, which is very nice. And this rating was nicely correlated with therapeutic alliance. So clinicians that were better able to elicit a therapeutic alliance between themselves and the patients. Those uh, patients then rated that the clinician's ability to understand the patient's pain was greater, which, which all makes sense. 
So when we looked at the brain response, one thing we found was that a greater, there was greater brain response to pain when being watched by the clinician. So this is the patient's brain response to the pain. And so you see greater response when um, um, the dyadic versus the sole condition. But interestingly, it was only when the clinician had built a relationship with the patient. So the clinical interaction, those that were randomized to the clinical interaction condition and had this intake and built a relationship with the clinician, they had this greater brain response during the dyadic compared to the solo condition. We did not see that uh, for the no interaction dyads. There was, there was no difference in brain response with the, while seeing the video of this clinician versus seeing a still image. And that was very interesting. When we directly contrasted between the clinical interaction and the no interaction dyads, we again found a lot of these same brain areas and specifically, especially the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex seemed to be driven by the um, clinical interaction condition in the dyadic um, assemblage. And this was correlated with the clinician's ability to understand the patient's pain. So if the patient rated a higher degree of the clinician be, being able to understand their pain, there was also greater dorsolateral prefrontal cortex response for the dyadic compared to the solo condition, which was interesting. Suggesting that this region is, is in fact quite important for modulating um, pain, the pain that they're rating, and also these uh, different conditions of dyadic versus solo interaction. So then we did another fMRI um, scan during this session where the clinicians are able to treat the patient's pain by pressing a button. So it's a similar design where there's a resting period of jittered and variable length followed by an anticipation cue. In this case, green means that they're gonna receive the pain and be treated with electroacupuncture. Red meaning that they're gonna receive the pain and will not be treated by electroacupuncture. So in both cases, they're getting the same amount of pressure during this uh, 10 second treatment and pain um, block of the block design. This is then followed by a rest period jittered in time and ratings with a uh, button box for pain and affect. In this case, the patient is rating how painful was the cuff and how did you feel about getting or not getting electroacupuncture, whereas the clinician is rating how painful was it for the patient and how did you feel about treating or not treating the patient. So what we found, first of all, was that during the treated condition, the patients are rating less pain intensity than during the no treated condition. And this is interpreted as a placebo analgesia because the amount of pressure that was enacted was exactly the same. And uh, we had both sham and real electroacupuncture conditions, which found no difference. And this was probably due to the fact that the amount of current that we used for the electroacupuncture was very small. It was infinitesimal. It was the smallest level we could give. And that's because, first of all, we did not want a somatosensory input going for the patient. We really wanted to focus on the relationship uh, that uh, we were testing and therapeutic lines that we were evaluating in the study. And so we set that level as being absolutely minimal. Um, and so in that case, we got no difference between real and sham acupuncture and the difference can in fact be interpreted as a placebo analgesia. Also for the effective ratings, the patients rated uh, much larger when being treated versus not treated. They very much liked being treated with the electroacupuncture. Uh, this was very similar to acupuncturists themselves, which thought that the vicarious pain was lower during the treated condition than during the no treated condition. And they very much liked treating the patients. The effective ratings were significantly higher for the treated versus the no treated condition. But what was, I think, really interesting when we looked at the data was that there was a correlation or a relationship between the analgesia as rated by the patient and the perceived efficacy as rated by the acupuncture. So somehow they, um, the acupuncturists were able to perceive the pain just by looking at the face of the patient. And so these two ratings were correlated. They were able to accurately perceive the efficacy of the electroacupuncture that they were doing. So the question is how might acupuncturists accurately perceive this efficacy? Is it potentially through the video transfer of facial expressions? And so here we used an automated uh, software. In this case, it was called Affectiva software, which uses these deep learning algorithms 
um, and uh, feature point tracking on facial videos in order to estimate um, different facial features and different types of emotions. And so uh, this is an, a very active area of research. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is used for many different kinds of applications. And here we used it uh, to try to better study the patient clinician relationship. So this is estimated by these like cardinal points and based on the, the changes in these points with the videos that we were recording during these sessions, you have different lower level features such as you know, inner brow raise and brow furrow and all these types of features, which then feed up into estimations of different emotions such as joy, anger, disgust, surprise, fear, sadness, and contempt. And so uh, this is the mapping that occurs. And what we found is that there was a mirroring in facial expressions between the patients and the clinicians. So I wouldn't pay too much attention to the exact emotion that's there. Uh, that's just what the software is attributing it to. But whatever the emotion was there by the patient, we see that the clinicians are also showing a similar emotion. And in case that's the, when we look at the, the delta from the treated to the no treated conditions, you see this very nice correlation across different emotions between the clinician and the patient in their changes for a treated to a no treated condition, suggesting that there is some sort of a following, some sort of leader follower relationship with these facial expressions. And when we calculated a mirroring kind of co uh, coefficient across all of the different uh, expressions, we found that there was a relationship between the care scores, the therapeutic alliance as rated by the patient and the mirroring and facial expressions between the clinician and the patient. So the more that they mirror, the more the clinicians are mirroring the patient, the greater the therapeutic alliance as rated by the patient. And also it was related to analgesia. The more facial expression mirroring you see between the patient and the clinician, the better the analgesia, the more the negative score is over here, which was really interesting. So we also have, and, and the reason I say that it's the clinicians following the patients is actually due to some other data that we've collected um, from the, um, in this case, it was, the, um, it was the high pain and the low pain setting. And what we found is by applying a neural network based Granger causality analysis to the data is, is that there was these causal kind of dynamics in facial expression transfer from the patient to the clinician. And this, this paper was uh, very recently published, actually. This, is, this should be updated. It's not just in review. But what we found was that, first of all, by looking at high pain versus low pain, we were able to identify specific uh, lower level facial expressions that were associated with pain. And that was principally these expressions over here, such as lip suck, eye closure, lid tightener, brow furrowing, et cetera. And then these were used to assess the patient's and the clinician's relationship uh, during the, um, the fMRI uh, protocol that I just showed you. And so what we found is that almost all of the, in fact, in this case, from a significant standpoint, all of the facial transfer was going in a causal direction from the patients to the clinicians. Basically, the clinicians are working really hard to try to connect with their patients, whether they had an interaction or not, and they do this by mirroring the facial expression of the patient. And so you could see that from a, from a temporal standpoint, the causal dynamics are running from the patients to the clinician across all of these different types of expressions. So why do clinicians mirror their patients? Well, first of all, mirroring is universal. From a very early age, babies learn to imitate the facial expressions to build alliance and empathy with their caregiver. Uh, this is a very important part of human development. Uh, babies are helpless creatures. If they don't connect with their parents, with adults, they, they will die. They need the care of, a, um, of, of an older, of a caregiver, being a parent or whatnot. And so part of the way they do this is try to bond with, the, with their adult, with their parent by mirroring facial expressions. So this is really very much built into our psyche as a human. So the question then is, do clinician-patient mirroring, does it also reflect therapeutic alliance and empathy? Is it supported by brain concordance and social mirroring circuitry? That was the next question that we asked. So here, 
we're looking at the brain response during this fMRI session. And we're specifically focusing on the anticipation cue period. And we do this because um, in this period, there's very similar um, basically stimulation and stimuli that are happening for both the patient and the clinician, as opposed to the pain period and treatment period itself, where there's different things that are happening for the patient and the clinician. And so we chose to focus on this anticipation cue period. And so here's the brain response in the patients and in the clinicians during the anticipation cue period. And one striking thing that you see is that the clinicians actually activate much stronger during this period than the patients do, which was a little bit surprising, right? Because it's the patients that are gonna be receiving the pain, but it's the clinicians that are activating to a much larger degree in um, um, a lot of cognitive prefrontal cortical areas, but also somatosensory focused areas. And so that's very interesting, I thought. And if we look at the conjunction between the activation and the patients and the clinicians, this is the conjunction map. So the conjunction map is in pink and in yellow is the conjunction map that's then intersected with ROIs, anatomically defined ROIs for the social mirroring circuitry that we defined a priori. And that's the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, anterior insula, temporal parietal junction over here. So how do we then assess brain concordance, right? Because if you just have this activation, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have brain concordance, right? And so this has been a problem that's been a part of hyperscanning for a very long time. Uh, there was a nice review by Burgess in 2013 that was really kind of focused more on EEG hyperscanning. And the caveat here is that we wanna avoid task-induced what's called pseudoconcordance. And pseudoconcordance basically just means that if I have some sort of stimulus, being it a bright flash or a very large sound, we will have auditory cortices that are lighting up in all of us that heard that sound, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we um, are interacting with one another, that there's some sort of brain-to-brain -brain concordance between two individuals. It just means that they were synchronous in time. And so instead, what we really wanna do, and this is a quote by Burgess, is that two oscillators can be said to be synchronized if the deviations from the regular oscillatory cycle of one oscillator provides information about the deviations in the oscillatory cycle of the other. So it's not just a mean brain response that we're interested in, which is what I showed you here with the conjunction, but it's, the, it's kind of the task to task, event to event, block to block change in the activation that we're interested to see if there's a following of one individual to the other. And so here what we did is that we started with the um, regions of interest defined in the conjunction map. And we took a region such as the TPJ in the patient, we track, we modeled it differently for each block. We tracked it over time to see how the activation changes from trial to trial to trial. And then we use this as a regressor of interest into the clinician's whole brain general linear model. We do this on the dyadic level for each one of up to our 37 dyads that were studied in this in this experiment. And what we found is that, first of all, that there was a difference in social interaction versus a no interaction condition. So when they were able to build a relationship compared to when they were not able to build a relationship, there was greater brain concordance between the patient's TPJ and these regions in the clinician for the, um, during the anticipation cue. And you can see that there's a lot of regions here that are tied into this concordance, but specifically, we're definitely hitting on ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, temporal parietal junction, anterior insula, um, also superior temporal sulcus. You can see over here, this is also sometimes referred to as part of the um, social mirroring circuitry. And you can see a lot of these areas are more concordant with the patient's TPJ during social interaction versus the no interaction. But when we tested all of these areas, it was only the right TPJ that was specifically correlated with placebo analgesia, meaning the greater the concordance from the patient's right TPJ to the clinician's right TPJ, the greater the analgesia that's reported by the patient. This was what was specifically related to pain relief in the patient, suggesting that it's the TPJ that's really a major focus of the therapeutic alliance and of the, it's leading into the placebo analgesia in the patient. So why TPJ? You know, what is the TPJ? The temporal parietal junction 
is known to be really important for a construct called theory of mind or mentalizing. In fact, a 2012 um, ALE meta-analysis found that actually the TPJ is, is specifically separating out theory of mind from empathy. You can see it's a very large number of studies in this, in this meta-analysis. And if we actually contrast theory of mind tasks versus empathy tasks, you get the, the, um, the TPJ as lighting up. So a little bit about theory of mind. Theory of mind is basically just the idea of try to interpret the thoughts and the actions of another cognitively. Whereas empathy, uh, and there's some nomenclature issues here, empathy, um, some researchers will divide up empathy into a, a affective empathy and a cognitive empathy. And cognitive empathy is really much more aligned with theory of mind. But other researchers say empathy is really just purely affective empathy. And that's just the idea of um, understanding the feelings of another, of another and kind of on an affective dimension not necessarily having to be on a cognitive dimension. But theory of mind is really more of a cognitive construct and understanding of another. And so our speculation here is that if we were to try to train clinicians, for example, in theory of mind, that might be more effective for building therapeutic alliance than even empathy training. Because I, I think a lot, of, um, a lot of training of clinicians and physicians is really trying to focus in on building therapeutic alliance in a better way. And um, a lot of that is geared towards empathy. We know that empathy is important, but empathy is also a lot harder to train. You know, a lot of times people are either empathic or they're not empathic, whereas theory of mind, I think as a cognitive construct would be a little bit easier to train. And there actually are theory of mind um, training programs that have been developed over the years, although not terribly common, I have to say. So our conclusions here is that understanding the brain circuitry, supporting patient-clinician interactions requires two-person methods, such as hyperscanning. Therapeutic alliance and TPJ concordance is enhanced by patient-clinician interaction and greater alliance has been linked with facial mirroring. Also, uh, Granger causality analysis can be applied to facial expression dynamics. And what we found is that uh, patient expressions are leading the clinicians, the clinicians are trying to follow their patients' expressions in order to build this alliance. Also greater TPJ to TPJ concordance and facial expression mirroring is associated with greater analgesia, suggesting that theory of mind processing via facial mirroring, i.e. nonverbal cues, can support socially mediated analgesia during the clinical context. And theory of mind as a cognitive construct can be enhanced by training in clinicians to improve clinical outcomes. So uh, this work, interestingly, was featured in a recent National Geographic special issue on pain. And um, the current studies are being led by Arvina Graal, who's in the lab. Uh, she um, is a PhD graduate from Hamburg, Christian Bucho's lab. And also Alessandra Anzolin, who's joined us from Rome, is very much involved as a postdoc in another spin-off study that we have ongoing with EEG concordance. And so here, um, this is Arvina, by the way, modeling our, our, uh, our masks. These are our, um, basically um, uh, masks that allow us to keep our study going during COVID. As, as I'm sure all of you know, a lot of our research was shut down during COVID for a period of time. And when we were able to come back to research, we needed to figure out some way that we could have some sort of face-to-face uh, -face interaction between clinicians and patients. And luckily our hospital invested in some of these clear masks uh, that they were using for in, in pediatric wards actually. And they were able to get us some of these masks. And so we were able to keep the study going even through the difficulty of the last few years with the help of these clear masks. And also the clear masks were very much used in um, an EEG. Um, experiment that we have ongoing where we are able to outfit the clinician and the patient with uh, caps and record EEG data during the clinical intake, which is something that we can't really do with functional MRI. And so we have this uh, system set up where we have a, a one-way mirror, all of the uh, equipment um, and the recording, the amplifiers are in one room, the patient and the clinician can be at peace in the other room in a very ecologically valid setting, interacting while we're recording data from both of them. 
And so hopefully we can write up some of this work in the, in the coming months. So thanks very much for your attention. Uh, this work uh, really has required the collaboration of many, many different individuals. Um, a lot of this work was actually, I think, Karin Jensen from Karolinska presented to you guys and um, in, the, in the past year. And uh, she, while a postdoc over at the Martino Center, ran a study imaging the, the clinicians um, in, a, in a single, not in a dyadic hyperscan environment, but in a single environment. And so that was also very much uh, um, of a uh, influence in our work. Also, um, Ted Kapchuk is my co-PI. He's a uh, placebo research researcher um, that's at Harvard Medical School as well. The software that we um, developed in-house and built in order to conduct the hyperscanning was written by Chung Jin Jung, who came over through a collaboration with Kiom in Korea. And Dan Michael is now back in Norway, ran the pilot study, and Arvina is um, uh, picking up in his stead with an ongoing fMRI hyperscan study that we have in the lab. And Alessandra, as I mentioned, is running the um, EEG hyperscan study. So also great thanks to all the funding agencies that uh, have supported this work over the years. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.